بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم دس از پارٹ جی دا سیونتھ پارٹ آف لیکچر فور ڈسکرپٹو اسٹیٹسٹکس اینڈ اسلامک اپروچ دس لیکچر لکس ایٹ دی کوانٹیٹی تھیوری آف منی ان آسٹریلین ڈیٹا ٹیکن فرام دی ڈبلو ٹی آئی ہیئر از دا ڈیٹا اٹ سیلف ٹیکن فرام دا ورلڈ ڈیولپمنٹ انڈیکیٹرز ڈیٹا سیٹ آف ورلڈ بینک دیر از اے کنٹری کوڈ فار آسٹریلیا Uh, GDP in current LCU is nominal GDP, that's the first column uh, after the years. And then there is GDP in constant LCU, local currency units, that's uh, also called the real GDP. Then we have the price index, which is the GDP deflator. Then we have M1, which is just money, and then M2, which is broad money. So these are these five series and the series run from 1960 to 2011 in this data set. The main idea of the quantity theory is that the prices change in proportion to the amount of money. So here we just plot the price series, the price index versus the uh, money series. So there are two money series that we are looking at, uh, money and broad money. And so we make these two plots the price against the money. Now, this is just the picture of the data as it is in the WDI. And this picture immediately shows us that these two series do not behave in the same way. The patterns are not the same. If you look at the pattern, you can see the rate of increase is the slope of the series. So uh, initially, both series start out flat. Then there is a period in which prices are rising rapidly while money is not rising so fast. Later on, the money starts, uh, the prices slow down. There is a, a narrow slope, shallow slope, but the money is increasing rapidly. So we can see that the pattern followed by the price is not the pattern followed by the money. Here is worth mentioning one thing that money is in um, the billions or millions while uh, price index is 100, 100 and uh, something more. So they are not comparable. If you plot them directly on the same series, you won't be able to see one or the other. So what we have done is to rescale the M1 by dividing by every point by the value in 2010, just like the index. So that makes the M1 equal to 100 in 2010, just like the price index. This doesn't matter because the actual levels do not matter. It is the pattern of the series. And that pattern does not change if we rescale the series. One of the key assumptions of the quantity theory is that the velocity is either uh, constant or it is exogenous and doesn't matter for the uh, understanding of the relation between money and prices. This graph plots the velocity of money for both M1 and M2. The top line is the velocity for M1. This means that we take the nominal GDP and divide by the quantity of money. That gives us the velocity. If you look at this top picture, it shows a clear pattern of increase starting from 1960 and go, uh, going up to about 1987. And then it shows a clear pattern of decrease. The velocity changes from 4 to about 10 and then it decreases from 10 to about 3. So there is a huge variation in the velocity. Uh, this immediately means that any idea that the velocity is constant or that it doesn't matter cannot be true. So again, this picture is enough to reject the quantity theory. Friedman has written a famous uh, statement that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. What this means is that the level of uh, the rise of prices can always be related to the rise in the quantity of money. These two graphs that we have seen where the velocity is changing and the pattern of prices is different from the pattern of prices is enough to show that Friedman is wrong. The price index series follows a different path from the money series. Inflation is not determined by the rate of change of money. Um, this uh, conclusion, you see, uh, cannot be changed by fancy analysis. Uh, students are deceived into thinking that by doing some funny things with the data, we can 
learn some more, but actually this is not true. The picture tells us everything we need to know. Prices is not are not completely determined by money. There are other things which are happening. A lot of literature discusses the breakdown of the money demand function in economics in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, so basically they were estimating uh, functions based on the quantity equation in which uh, money demand, which is uh, log uh, money over prices, uh, was related to the real uh, product, which is Q. So this can be, you can uh, get this equation out of the MV equals PQ by taking logs. That leads to log M plus log V equals log P plus log Q. Subtract prices from both sides and you get log M over P is a function of the real GDP and some error. The error will automatically include the velocity. The standard method for estimating regressions is to assume that the error is just a random fluctuation noise. It does, should not have any systematic patterns. Uh, here, the error must include the log of the velocity, and the log of velocity has systematic patterns, which means that this function cannot be estimated in a stable way. For remember that up to about 1989, velocity was going up continuously. And so in that situation, it might be possible to get some systematic relationship. But when the velocity is behaving in different ways across the period, going up for some part and going down, then the money equation which ignores velocity cannot be uh, stable. So the data already shows us that uh, a stable money demand cannot be obtained from this data. In a previous graph, we looked at the velocity for um, M1 and M2 in the same graph. Uh, this is uh, the velocity for money to M2 broad money on a different graph. The point that I'm making here is that the graph itself is uh, important because the scale of the graph matters. In the previous graphs, the, the change was compressed because the other uh, picture was going from 4 to 10 to 3. And so the change from 2.5 to 1 was very small in comparison and the graph showed that. Now when you look at it separately then the change in V2 is also quite dramatic. It is more or less constant in the early period from up to up to about 1984 uh, going from only from 2 to 2.5 fluctuating in that range. So in that range one would expect to see a stable money demand function because the velocity is not going to make much difference. Uh, in over in this range and that is what happened in fact up, to, up until early 80s you could estimate a stable money demand function but after 80 velocity declines quite dramatically going from 2.5 to 1 and this is obviously going to affect any relationship between money and, and GNP if you're not taking into account that the MV equals PQ and so uh, this change must be reflected in any relationship. And when you ignore velocity by saying it's constant or exogenous, you're not going to be able to understand what's happening to the money demand. So just to recapitulate what we learned from this picture of the velocity, velocity behaves in a systematic and predictable way. Velocity is not constant. Uh, even if velocity is exogenous, that is, it, does, it is not explained by money or GDP, it matters. It, it is, uh, you cannot understand the relation between money and GDP without taking into account what is happening to the velocity. So any theory that we do about the money uh, must take into account the changing velocity over time. Now we come to the plot of the quantities the, if inflation and money growth. The previous plot was just the amount of money and the level of prices. The inflation is the rate of change of prices. Here I have made this log of PT divided by PT minus 1. This is one way of measuring inflation uh, and I have written this as percentage P and I have explained why this is the right variable in the previous lecture. Now if you look at the first graph which looks at uh, 
the rate of change of money and plots it against the rate of change of price, you can see that the two are behaving very differently. Uh, prices go up and down, uh, yani, uh, money moves up and down rather uh, erratically and rather rapidly. Prices fluctuate uh, less than the money. The same kind of differences in patterns of behavior of uh, money changes with prices is available in the second graph which looks at M2. So from these graphs it's clear that there is no simple relationship between money growth and inflation. Now one thing that would be surprising to many students is that there is no magic. Uh, we have done all the data analysis that needs to be done. This is uh, the reason that this looks surprising is most, most data analysis use lots of heavy machinery. But Actually, the graph provides all the information that the data contains. When we look at the graph, we are looking at all of the data. There is no more information available. The um, way the statistics and econometrics are done, uh, we do a lot of very complicated analysis. And this leads students to believe that by doing complicated analysis of simple data, you can get more information out of it. This is wrong. Uh, this is a wrong concept because actually what happens when we do a complicated analysis is that we make very, very complicated assumptions about the data generating process. So the, it's these assumptions that allow us to get more, um, uh, more out of the data, more inferences. So basically the crucial issues are the assumptions that we make valid the answer is that there is no way to find out and most likely these assumptions are not valid. So if we do, do a standard what is called an ARDL, autoregressive distributed lags analysis of this data, you will come to the conclusion that money demand is explained by the real GDP after including sufficient lags. This is a wrong conclusion because it's based on making assumptions about regression models uh, which are listed in textbooks. All of these assumptions are uh, complicated assumptions which actually do not hold. There is a lot of evidence that you can uh, get from this picture that shows that the regression model assumptions are not valid. But uh, the assumptions of the regression model are often not testable at all because they are based on uh, underlying process which generates the data about which we know nothing. So these assumptions cannot be tested and that's why we get these complicated inferences. So what is the thing to do? The thing to do goes in directions which are not contemplated in conventional statistics. Once we look at this breakdown, we realize that velocity changes. Now, now we need to learn about more about why the velocity changes. And this cannot be done by examining this data. The information is not there in this data. What we need to do is to think more about how money behaves in Australia. Why are there these zips, uh, these zigzag pattern? What was the Monetary Policy Committee doing? How did the prices behave? What are these determinants of these prices? This cannot be done by doing more data analysis. What we need to do is to look at the actual behavior of the Australian economy uh, in terms of looking at what was happening. So we need to go beyond the numbers to look at the real world facts themselves. And this is how di data analysis needs to be done. The data points to a pattern in reality and then further study must be done of the reality itself to understand the data.